So now in this final flowchart, which we'll entitle Human Ear 3, we'll conclude our look at the human ear and finish up this lecture. We're continuing now our look through the structure of the human ear. We've gone over the outer ear, the middle ear, and now what's left is the inner ear. And the inner ear plays a major role in the overall function of hearing, as we'll see. For the inner ear, take a look at figures 50.11, and also 50.12. They show the functional uh, capabilities of the inner ear in a very nice visual format, specifically in regards to the action potentials. We can get very confusing if you're just looking at the words. So let's begin. The inner ear, we left off in the previous video by stating that the oval window transmits these vibrations to the cochlea. And the cochlea is going to be the portion of the inner ear that we're focusing on. So the cochlea is the spiral tube that's seen in figure 50.10 and also in figure 50.12, I believe. Now, what's going to be happening here? This is going to be a chamber-like structure, and it's going to have several chambers within it. And these chambers will be filled with something called perilymph. Filled with perilymph. So perilymph is just a fluid. Okay, so now you have to think, we're changing this vibrational pattern and this vibrational message, and we're putting it not only through air now, but it might also have to go through some sort of fluid called perilymph, okay? Because that's the next step in this movement of sound. The structure, the cochlea, is going to specifically contain three subparts that to know about. That will be the upper vestibular canal, so this is on the upper portion, if you look at the figure, it'll make a lot more sense as to what's upper and what's lower. But there's an upper vestibular canal. And then there's also going to be, in between the two upper and lower parts, there's going to be a cochlear duct. And then above the cochlear duct, it's going to be the lower tympanic canal. So now, what I want to just focus on for a second is this middle portion. So it separates the upper and lower parts. Um, so we'll state that right over here. It separates the two that we just mentioned. And in doing so, it's going to play a big role um, as the structure that's going to be involved or have the structure that will be involved in much of the hearing process. It also contains a portion of it, the cochlear duct, contains a part of it known as the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane within the cochlear duct is actually just literally on the floor of the cochlear duct. Okay, it's the very bottom of the cochlear duct, and in between the cochlear duct is going to be the upper part, the vestibular canal, and the lower tympanic canal. So make sure you can look at this on figure 50.10 and also 50.12 and get a visual understanding of what we're talking about. So now, let's get into function. Structure's done. Let's look at the actual hearing that happens. So within the inner ear, you have that oval window, right? The oval window got the information from the middle ear, from the three bones, the ossicles, and that oval window was vibrating as a result of that. Okay, that was the transmitted message, vibration. The sound waves turned into vibration, and it's been traveling. Once the oval window has been vibrating, those pressure waves being created by the vibration they're waves of pressure, and remember, this is, this is the ear. It's full of mechanical receptors. Pressure waves are going to actually be transmitted to now a new medium, a new sort of place where they flow through. And these pressure waves will now be transmitted to the fluid, okay? The fluid specifically in the inner ear, the cochlea, and that's going to be transmitted to fluid that's found within the upper vestibular canal, so the vestibular canal will contain perilymph, and it will get the vibrational frequency from the oval window, and so will the tympanic canal. So both of these get this vibrational information, and it uh, sort of encompasses or flows within the fluid that's found within these two canals. So in the vestibular and tympanic canals, do we have these pressure waves being transmitted? Once these pressure waves are transmitted within these two canals, you will cause the basilar membrane, which is that floor of the cochlear duct, to vibrate. And it vibrates specifically up and down after getting this information from the other two layers. 
vibrates up and down. Okay, but how does this relate to hearing? Let's take a bit of a sidetrack now and look at something else for a second. In the inner ear, you're also going to have what is known as the organ of corti, or corti, whatever you want to call it. Organ of corti is what I call it. So this is going to be a big functional part of the inner ear and of hearing as a whole. This is the major auditory organ. Okay, It is known as an organ because it contains specific cells that are very much specialized and differentiated for hearing. So it's an auditory organ that is directly with those mechanoreceptors that we talked about. Remember how we said hearing is all about mechanoreception and mechanoreceptors, pressure, waves, whatever it may be, sound as well? Those mechanoreceptors that we talked about are all found in the organ of corti, and these are going to be the ones that specifically detect stimulus. They detect changes, in other words, specifically in pressure waves. So if you have a pressure wave that's going to cause a very loud or is from a very loud noise, that stimulus will be detected in a different way than, let's say, a very quiet noise that's being transmitted as pressure waves through the air. So as sound waves through the air and then converted, I should say, to pressure waves in the ear. So we start in the air as sound waves, convert to pressure waves. Those pressure waves then are transmitted into fluid within the vestibular and tympanic canals. But now, why did I mention the organ of corti? Okay. Why do I mention this? This is because as the auditory canal with the mechanoreceptors capable of detecting change, we're going to notice that within the cochlear duct, okay, remember that's just that middle, middle portion right over here between the upper and lower canals that are found within the inner ear, within the cochlear duct on top of the basilar membrane, Basilar, let me make sure I spell this right. So this is actually in reference to the organ of corti. I should say it is, this structure is found within the cochlear duct and it's specifically on top of the basilar membrane. This is going to be important in just a second. And below the tectorial membrane. So now, I know this is very difficult to visualize. Please, please look at figure 50.10 as we talk about this. So we have this cochlear duct region, and it's going to have within it the organ of corti. And the organ of corti is going to be right on top of the, of the basilar membrane, but below the tectorial membrane. So we have the organ of corti here, then we have the tectorial membrane here, and then uh, below the organ of corti, we have the basilar membrane. Okay? And this is all within what structure? This is all within the cochlear duct. Okay, So that's a very poor visualization of it, but hopefully you get the idea here. This is going to be big in just a second. So let's take a look at this tectorial membrane. Why did we throw this into the equation now? The tectorial membrane, the uh, tectorial membrane is a very important structure here because it is in contact with the specific mechanoreceptors, the specific cells, I should say, that literally do hearing, that are the ones that can hear technically. The tectorial membrane is in contact with those hair cells that detect the changes, as you remember from the, our initial look at the ear. Those hair cells will be in contact with the tectorial membrane, but the tectorial membrane itself, note something about it right below it. It doesn't move, okay? The tectorial membrane doesn't vibrate even if the, the hair cells are vibrating. So what's going to happen is this is going to be a very rigid structure. And the organ of corti is going to contain these hair cells that will be bumping into this very rigid structure up and down, up and down as a result of hearing. How so? What's going to be happening is the following. Take a look here. We're going to have this happening. Basilar membrane vibrates up and down. Look what we're going to do. We're right back at where we left off. This is why we sort of sidetracked. We're back to it right here. So now let's reiterate something. That bottom basilar membrane, BM for basilar membrane, vibrates up and down just like we stated. Okay. Now why is it vibrating up and down? Well, that's because it got a transmission from the oval window 
and from the fluid that's within the upper vestibular canal and the lower tympanic canal. So now this structure is going to be vibrating up and down, up and down, causing the organ of corti itself to move up and down. The organ of corti is what contains the hair cells that are here. So now this structure, the organ of corti, will also move up and down. But what's going to happen? Is the tympanic membrane going to move? No, it actually doesn't move because it's so stiff. It doesn't vibrate. That's why we stated it here. Let's look at the implications of that now. What the overall result of this is the following. Those hair cells that are a part of the organ of corti, that are receiving mechanical information and can detect changes, those hair cells are going to be, the term here is deflected by that very stiff tympanic, uh, that very stiff tectorial membrane, I should say. So TM for the tectorial membrane. It's very stiff. It doesn't move. It doesn't budge. This is going to directly cause the following. This causes the hair cells to be stimulated. So let's write this down. The hair cells are going to be stimulated. Now why are they going to be stimulated as a result of the tympanic, as a result of the tectorial membrane not moving? Well, this is because because when they don't move, when the tectorial membrane doesn't move, it causes the hair cells to create a receptor potential that's depolarized. We don't need to get into the details of why that happens, but just note that the receptor potential as a result of the of this organ of corti moving up and down because the basilar membrane is moving down and because the tympanic membrane is not moving, this is going to cause these little hair cells that I drew up here to, call, to undergo receptor potential depolarization. So their receptor potential depolarizes. You should know, you should be an expert at this. If you have receptor potential depolarizing, this means that you will, of course, have an action potential. Action potential is a direct indicator of, the, of an action that is going to happen. And what's the action that's going to happen? What's going to happen here is that the axons of these hair cells, and this is shown well in the figure 50.10, these axons of these hair cells, they're all basically going to connect together like this, sort of like this. Hopefully it's not budging this picture too much. These hair cells will all connect their axons together to form a nerve of some sort. That nerve is going to be called the auditory nerve. Axons of hair cells combine to form to form auditory nerve. And so if they're going up and down and not and not budging because the tectorial membrane is not budging, they're getting stimulated, and their potential is depolarizing, and they're getting action potentials within them. All of these action potentials are going to travel through this big auditory, uh, auditory nerve and go to a very important organ. Okay, let me finish writing this, auditory nerve. If they are traveling, this action potentials are traveling down this auditory nerve towards the brain, right? This is the final step here. This is the final sensation and end of the sensory pathway. This is going to overall, this auditory nerve sends message to brain for processing. That's the end of here. That's what happens when you hear. All of these steps coalesce instantaneously in milliseconds, in nanoseconds. You can hear me right now because of this complicated yet very much, I would say, beautiful way that the ear works, okay? This just goes to show you, and that's the conclusion of this lecture, so you can finish writing this, that's the conclusion of the idea of sensation. We started with the idea of synapses. Synapses are very important because they are going to be involved in changing and underlying memory and learning, and we sort of pushed that sort of to the side and focused on sensation as a whole, and the human ear is a great example of a sensory pathway that occurs through this outer inner and middle ear structure that we've highlighted. Hopefully through this you've gained a greater appreciation for the voice that you're hearing right now. For anything that you hear from this point forward, you can see that it's a very much involved process that results in hopefully and most of the time a very nice result within the brain of hearing something. So next time you're listening to music, whatever it may be, make sure you thank your organ of corti.